Can you imagine Usopp becoming one of the most important characters in the story? Fulfilling prophecies, acquiring Conqueror's hockey, and even taking out one of the Yonko? No? Well, I can. I think that after Whole Cake Island being Sanji's arc and Wano being Zoro's arc, Elbaf will be the arc of God Usopp, where the cowardly, insecure and lying boy from Syrup Village will become one of the fiercest and bravest warriors the endless seas of One Piece have ever seen. So put on your best pair of sniper goggles and allow me to share with you the gospel of the almighty and all-knowing creator of One Piece, God Usopp. Hi there, my name is Manu and Usopp has always held a very special place in my heart out of any fictional character really. Today I want to walk you through his incredible character arc until Wano that turned him into one of the most beloved characters in fiction and then share a number of carefully selected exquisite theories with you that might foreshadow some major developments for Usopp and his powers very soon. Usopp is an incredibly interesting character in a multitude of ways. Take his name for example. Usopp is a combination of the famous Greek storyteller and fabulist Aesop and the Japanese word Uso that literally means lie. Oda clearly was fully aware of where he wanted the character to go. Because Usopp is both a great liar and a fantastic storyteller and on top of that he is by far the most quote unquote normal member in a crew of absolute monsters which made it super easy for me to relate to his experience traveling with the Straw Hats. I was incredibly impressed how well established these fundamental traits were at Syrup Village where we first get to meet Usopp. Immediately, you and I know that this is someone who craves attention above anything else. He lies and exaggerates to any and everyone he meets just to have people notice him. <laughs> This is literally the story of Peter and the wolf. This deceptiveness and pretentiousness in everything he says and does made Usopp extremely unlikable to me initially. However, just a little later, we find out why. Usopp is basically an orphan. His mother died when he was still young and his father left him to become a pirate. Now. To be fair, it was Shanks who is fighting for a better world and I don't think Yasop is a bad person from what I can tell so far, but let's be real, he doesn't deserve a father of the year award for it either. In my eyes, this left Usopp with two choices, resent his father for leaving or, as he did in the end, glorifying him for it. After all, why would he leave his only kid behind if he wasn't a legendary pirate with very important work to do? This really hits home hard when you realize that it's probably exactly this insecurity about being left behind that led to Usopp's chronic lying in the first place. He lies about being a great and powerful pirate, having had many adventures just like his father because he feels like he could never truly be this person in reality. Instead, he sees himself as weak, insecure and worthless. In arguably his worst sight. Keep that in mind for Water 7. At the same time, however, I love that we also get introduced to the best in Usopp. On the sick beds of his dying mother and of his friend Kaya, he also fabricates stories. <laughs> However, while his usual lies are meant for getting himself some attention, these stories are meant to brighten up the day of people he truly cares about. It's the storyteller inside him caring for others, and to me it's exactly this altruism that is the basis for Usopp becoming a brave warrior of the sea. And oh boy, if the theories I have in store for you are just a little bit true, he will be a great warrior indeed. It's during his fight with Chu on Arlong Park that he finds this dream. <laughs> but honestly, I do believe that Usopp is brave right from the very beginning. 
Usopp's cowardice is actually very much self-imposed. Effectively, it's another one of his lies. And this even links to the concept of him telling lies that later become true. Usopp's self-doubt acts as what is called a self-fulfilling prophecy. Even though he's often scared, in the end he always decides to stay, fight and do the right thing. He has shown time and time again that when it really counts, he's undeniably brave, proud and honorable. So to me, his arc is not at all about becoming brave, because bravery requires fear to be overcome in the first place. No, to me, his real arc is about building confidence, accepting himself and finding a purpose. The next big step in his character arc is during Alabaster. And honestly, I couldn't help but be incredibly impressed how he overcomes his fear to be hurt and once again steps out against an opponent he thinks is way out of his league. Already at this point here, he's willing to give his life for his captain and declares his loyalty to Luffy. Interestingly enough, however, just a while later, we experience Usopp's lowest point in the story so far. However, I'd argue that his fight with Luffy and his leaving the crew doesn't diminish his belief that Luffy will be Pirate King at all. The Going Merry, the ship they had been given by his village, has become a full member of the crew, to the point where Usopp could even see a manifestation of its spirit, something that will be important later on, by the way. Conqueror's hockey. Now, this member of the crew had gotten too weak to fulfill its purpose and was about to be left behind by the rest. Usopp sees himself to be the next in line. Despite all the courage he has already shown, he still has the world's biggest imposter syndrome. It's the very same reason why he tried to forcibly put himself on a level with Luffy. He's struggling to find a purpose that allows him to stay useful and stay with the crew. <laughs> At this point, Usopp is the only one that doesn't have a fixed role in the crew yet. He isn't recognized at the sniper yet at this point. Only during Ennis Lobby does he come back as Soge King, a representation of everything Usopp thinks he wants to be. He hides behind a mask that allows him to slip into a more confident persona. As a result, his actions on Ennis Lobby establish him as the sniper of the crew and after witnessing the lengths that Luffy would go to to keep a crew member through Robin, he finally overcomes his fear of being left behind and apologizes to everyone. <laughs> Thriller Bark, however, proves to us how insecure Usopp still is, even under the mask of Soge King, all while once again taking down a strong opponent. I was very positively surprised to see then that Dress Rosa out of all places was Usopp's biggest moment of character development yet. The Tontada have put all their hopes into Usopp, thinking that their hero Usolando will come and help them. The stress for Usopp in this arc has been building up steadily and in the end he just couldn't handle the pressure of the responsibility he had brought onto himself with his own lies, so he runs away. Unfortunately, Usopp represents one of the main themes of Dressrosa here, deception. All this time, though Flamingo had been deceiving the Tontada and Usopp was essentially doing the same thing. However, in the end, their cries finally reach Usopp. Without Soge King to hide behind, he finally accepts himself as a true and strong member of the Straw Hat crew. <laughs> Usopp gains confidence in himself and his capabilities to be a real hero and is rewarded immensely for it with one of my favorite moments after the time skip. As a result, the Usopp we see in Wano is the most confident but also most competent version of him we have ever seen, turning the tides wherever he appears. So, now that I want to move on to Usopp's future in the story, what's important to know is that Usopp keeps fulfilling many of his major lies, one after another, becoming more and more the hero he aspires and I guess fantasized as a kid to be. As always, everything from here on out is speculation based on my previous analysis, but I'm really excited about all of these possibilities. And as you probably 
already suspected, Elbaf will be the basis for all of these theories. Elbaf, spelled backwards after all, is Fable, and it'll be the most important arc for our storytelling Fable Master yet. Throughout the story, Usopp has forged relationships with all the giants that he's met. First on Little Garden with Dory and Broggy that inspire him to become like the giant warriors, enforcing his dream and promising to go to Elbaf. On Anna's Lobby, he frees Oimu and Kashi from their bonds to the world government, perfectly reciting the giant's weapons and techniques. <laughs> And after fighting side by side with them, once again he promises to meet them in Elbaf. And finally, he gains the respect of Hyrudin on Dressrosa, who declares him a god, giving Usopp a very high standing across multiple generations among the giants of Elbaf. The first lie I'd like to look at is uh, this one. <laughs> As I've discussed in my big One Piece theory, Noland is actually one of the most influential characters in the entire story and a direct parallel to Roger himself. Outside of Shandora, Noland traveled the New World multiple times and is worshipped by the Tontada as well. And so Usopp is tied to Noland through the two statues he has, one in Shandora and one in Dressrosa. And so I think it would make a lot of sense for Noland to also have been to Elbaf. One very popular idea is that Usopp will defeat Loki, the current ruler of Elbaf, which would fit Usopp's character arc perfectly, by the way. A great reference to David vs. Goliath, a legend in which the small David defeats the giant Goliath with a slingshot. And I don't find it too far-fetched to theorize that Usopp might find out about his relationship to Noland here as well. If this were true, this could have some major implications for Usopp. It is quite possible that Noland, just like Roger, was one of the people who inherited Joy Boy's will while failing to keep the promises they made. Other characters that might fall into this line are Binks and Nika, and the Sun God was actually mentioned the very first time during Noland's flashback. And as you know, Usopp has also earned the status of a god. And so if this were true, it would actually not be Luffy, but Usopp, who would be the inheritor of Joy Boy's will and setting him up as the liberator of the giants. Now, I do still think that Luffy is Joy Boy, but I did find this line of thought very entertaining. And even if Usopp was just a descendant of Noland, that would already be pretty awesome in itself. Next, let's look at something that has been hinted at a lot throughout the story. Usopp getting Congress Hockey. Yes, you've heard me right, I'm suggesting that uh, the Usopp, our Usopp might unlock what only Luffy and Zoro have within the crew so far. So how does the ambition and will of a king fit together with the King of Cowards? Well, the very first clue is already in the name. Usopp has proclaimed himself to be a powerful pirate captain throughout the story and wants to become a brave warrior of the sea. In a way, he has these kingly ambitions in a more literal sense than even Luffy and Zoro. As for willpower, I already have explained that to me, Usopp has been brave and strongly willed right from the start. The only thing holding Usopp back really are his self-doubts and his self-image. However, this is slowly melting away. Usopp has already unlocked one type of hockey, and that on the most extreme level we have seen in the story so far, picking out the exact aura of a person miles away from him. So could there have been any hints in the story similar to Zoro? I believe that there is actually a ton of foreshadowing for this. Usopp has actually lied about having Conqueror's hockey twice now. Once in this scene here with the Tontada, and a second time during the raid on Onigashima. Additionally, we have two instances where Usopp knocks out powerful opponents by literally crushing their will. Once with Sugar, and once with Corona. Both times we can see the characteristic foaming mouth that is reserved for someone knocked out by Congress Haki. 
And as we know, Conqueror's Haki relates very much to one's spirit and spiritual presence, as well as to one's ability to affect the spirits of others. And Usopp was originally the only one able to interact with the Going Mary's Club Ultiman. So could this be another one of his lies coming true once Usopp reaches his full potential in Elbath? Well, I would lie if I told you that I wouldn't absolutely love it. To round things up, now that we have a quite powerful Usopp, the last theory I want to discuss has been proposed by a Reddit user called Africhik, who proposes that Usopp might be the one to bring an end to Big Mom's chase after the Straw Hats. Shout out to her, or him. Or, yeah. We have already talked about Usopp's relationship with the Giants, and Big Mom shares this affinity with him. She has gone to great lengths to try and include the Giants into her peace project and has been inspired by their warrior spirit as well. As you might have noticed, one of her main attacks is the same giant technique used by Dori and Bragi. <laughs> She actually uses it three times, once on Holkick Island, once on the life floor in Onigashima, and once on the rooftop with Kaido. And yet, funnily enough, the only Straw Hat who hasn't experienced this attack yet is Usopp, the man who knows all of Dori's and Bragi's techniques. Both of these character arcs are on a direct collision course for Elbaf, and yet their standing among the giants couldn't be any more different. Big Mom, who is seen as a force of destruction, and Usopp, who has been heralded as a warrior and a god. So Usopp might well be the only person to end the feud between the Straw Hats and Big Mom herself. To solidify all this, we're gonna have some shenanigans with the chapter numbers again. You do know I love these, but this time, instead of the word plays, we'll just rearrange some of the numbers, because Oda does love doing it. For instance, take the first panels of chapter 592 and 925, or 387 and 783. The chapters I want to look at here are chapter 834, titled My Dream, that shows Big Mom talking about her dream to unite all the people and have the giants with her, as well as chapter 483, The End of the Dream, which features Lola out of all people, the daughter who ruined the wedding with Loki. As we've already said, Usopp has the exact opposite standing with the giants than Big Mom, two sides of the same coin, so what happens if we flip it? Chapter 438, in which Usopp chooses to return to the crew instead of his dream of going to Elbaf. What really blew my mind here is that actually no matter which way you rearrange these three numbers, it always has to do with characters thinking that they have to give up their dreams. 348 is the chapter that Robin chooses to go with CP9 in order to protect the Straw Hats, giving up on her dream of learning the history of the world and Saul's last wish of finding her friends. 384, the chapter where Usopp tells Oimo and Kashi the truth, moments before they thought they had to give up on their dreams of seeing their captains ever again. And chapter 843, the chapter that Sanji tells Luffy that he's leaving, giving up on his dream of the All Blue in order to protect his friends. So what do you think will Usopp say when he sees Big Mom's attack? Will he say that he's actually friends with Dory and Brogy? That he's fought side by side with the giants and that he has Hyrodin as his underling? It would sound like the biggest lie he's ever told, but turn out to be nothing but the truth. Another character that is strongly linked to Elbaf and Nordic mythology is none other than Shanks himself. If you want to know why, I strongly recommend you check out that video right there. Oh, it was, it was there. Okay. Right there. Right there. It is right here. Yeah. 